Uh, my name is Natalie Draper, um, and I'm going to be the host for this first webinar that we have today. Um, and its title is, So You Want to Compose for the Organ? Here are some things to know. Uh, this webinar is going to serve as an introduction to the instrument and will include tips for composers. And it's primarily geared toward composers who have little to no prior experience writing for the organ. So our panel for this webinar includes Ann Laver, who has already introduced herself. We also welcome George Baker, distinguished composer, organist, and recently retired, retired dermatologist. George, if you'd like to say hello. Hi, everyone. I had to unmute my microphone. So <laughs> there I am. Hello. We're so glad you're here. Thank uh, you. Jonathan Embry, composer, alumnus of Syracuse University and organist at Most Holy Rosary Catholic Church in Syracuse is also with us. Jonathan, would you say hello? Hello. And uh, I'd also like to welcome Joseph Downing, uh, my colleague in the Syracuse Composition and Theory Department and organist at Plymouth Congregational Church in downtown Syracuse. Welcome, Joe. Good morning, everyone. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be with you today. We're so glad you're here. We invite you to visit our event registration page, which has a full bio for each of these panelists. In this webinar, I will present the panelists with a few questions to consider about strategies for approaching the instrument and writing your first organ piece. I'll be keeping an eye on the clock and shortly before one o'clock, we're going to stop and we'll share some resources for further study, including a video that introduces our composer interview project. After that, we will give some time for questions. You're welcome to post your questions to the chat at any time and we'll sort of collect those and, and answer them at the end of the webinar. This summer, I got to go through the process of writing my first organ piece, which was really an exciting thing for me. And it's the piece that Annie is gonna be premiering on tonight's virtual concert. I was really lucky in the sense that um, I got to ask Joe Downing uh, to give me a tutorial for, on the organ at Plymouth Congregational Church in downtown Syracuse. And then Joe and Kathy, who works there, were kind enough to let me use the space and sit at the instrument. So I think that I'll just start with one of the biggest first suggestions that we can give all composers is if you can get yourself in front of the instrument because it really makes a huge difference. It can be very inspiring. You learn a lot very quickly about what the organ can and cannot do. Um, so with that in mind, I thought I'd address the first question to Joe. What are some of the initial physical aspects of playing the organ that a composer should be aware of? And so for this, I'm thinking of the physical realities of the manuals, the pedals, the stop logistics, et cetera. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Natalie. So the first thing, uh, the first biggest thing to note about the organ is that it is not a piano. And people look at the organ and it looks like a piano. It looks like a piano with two, three, or maybe even four or five keyboards. But the essential nature of playing the instrument is very different from playing the piano. Organ technique is a very different thing from playing on a piano. One of the blessings of the organ is that it can sustain a note forever. As long as you keep your finger on a key, that note is going to keep sounding. One of the problems of the organ is it only keeps sounding as long as your finger is on the key. So this is something very different from the piano. Because on the piano, for instance, a very typical effect of the piano is to play a low note and then run up and play a big arpeggio and leave the pedal on. And I've asked, um, Dr. Labor, if she would just demonstrate that on the piano, kind of a typical low note and then some kind of atonal arpeggio up. You got it. And Notice all those notes continue ringing the whole time. A lot of the time, she didn't even have her hands on the keys. An effect like that is impossible on the organ. And I don't know, Dr. Labor, do you want to show us how it's not possible? 
Sure. <laughs> So you notice that when, as soon as she lifted her left hand off those low notes, they stopped sounding. So it, it was a, a very musical effect that she produced, but it was quite different on the piano, from the piano, where the piano sustained all those notes the whole time. On the organ, only the notes that you hold down are going to sustain. So because there is no damper pedal on the organ, we have a lot of pedals down there, but none of them are a damper pedal. When you play the organ, the basic technique that people are assuming that you're going to use is a legato technique. That is the most, the, the most typical. In fact, um, the French style of, of organ playing in the 19th century, especially the late 19th century, was based upon really elaborate exercises so that you could connect everything and play very smoothly together. On the piano, if you want to play, let's say you want to uh, play adjacent first position or, or first inversion triads, you can play them legato. Now, what you do is you just play them and then you lift your hand, leaving the pedal down and you play the next one, switch the pedal, Play the next one, switch the pedal, etc. On the organ, there's no damper pedal. So the basic technique of organists is to fake that. If I were playing two first position, uh, two first inversion triads, let's say EGC going to FAD, what I'm probably going to do is I'm going to use my fourth finger for the C so I can play to the D there. I'm going to use my second finger going to my third for the G to A, and I'm probably going to slide my thumb from E to F as best I can. And you can learn to use the back and the front part of your thumb so that that happens. And then if I want to continue up the scale slowly, probably while I'm playing that D minor triad, I'm going to substitute my second and fourth fingers so that I can repeat the process for the next chord. And that's, you can kind of see what my fingers are doing. My thumb is just sliding up. Now on the piano, you wouldn't do that. You would just play this and use the same fingering for every single one. Uh, Dr. Labor, could you kind of demonstrate um, those yeah. first inversion? I'll try to play it uh, low on the organ so you can see my hands better. Okay. So if you saw Dr. Labor's left hand there, you notice that she was using, for the lowest two notes, she was using 5-3, um, going to 4-2. And the minute she played 4-2, she substituted her 5-3 again, moved up. OK, so this is just one example of what organists do all the time. Um, and you need to be aware of that. One of the things that's atypical of the organ, but very typical of piano writing, is writing fistfuls of chords. Um, I remember playing Percy Granger's English Country Garden when I was in high school on the piano. And I remember the passage where the left hand has five note chords. So every single finger is on a chord and they come at the rate of about one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, just about that fast. And of course, on the piano, you use the pedal to connect them. And that's no problem. On the organ, those same chords would have to be staccato because to play a chord and then you have to lift it up, get ready for the next one, play it, lift it up, get ready for the next one. And organists, Talk about worrying about how long a note is. If you do that sloppily on the organ, it sounds really bad. 
So for instance, I learned being a little bit older than many people here, I learned the old Marcel Dupre method where repeated notes are exactly half their value or in compound time, two thirds of their value. So you play eighth rest, eighth rest, eighth rest, eighth rest, eighth rest, eighth rest, just like that. You can't even just slap the chord and go on to the next one. You have to think very carefully about how long that note is because it's very evident to the audience if you're being sloppy or not. Um, so it doesn't mean that you can't have fistfuls of chords. And I wanted, uh, I don't know if Anne, if you chose to play the messian at the end. No, something messianish. Messianish, okay. <laughs> because I think of sometimes messian writes for these big fistfuls of chords, but he knows that there's gonna be a break in there. <laughs> So you heard the break in between every note. It would be impossible to play that legato because, you know, unless you had two organists or a four-handed organist, um, which are relatively rare these days. <laughs> Another thing that's very typical of the pianist is arpeggios. Arpeggios, and again, they rely on the pedal to make the, to make the arpeggio smooth. It's not that arpeggios are impossible on the organ. Sometimes they happen, but they're not easy and they require much more practice. Um, may, and can you just play us some arpeggio with one hand maybe? Okay, so you heard, and there was a little slip in there because I didn't tell Dr. Labor ahead of time, she didn't have a chance to practice it. And that's, that's the sort of thing that can happen very easily. <clears throat> Generally, if you think, this is a good rule for composers to think, an organist is very connected to the instrument all the time, while a pianist quite often has the hands hover above the instrument, just plunking down to sound the note, but then the hand is free to get ready for whatever next thing that it might have to do. Um, okay, so now I want to move on and talk just for a minute or two about the feet on the organ. That's one of the things that fascinates people, playing the organ with your foot. And you need to know that modern technique says you've got the heel and the toe of each foot. So you've got two feet and a heel and a toe for each one. So if, if you're playing just with one foot, you could play C, D, E, F, G, and just by rotating your foot around, you could play up a scale. Now, if you tried with one foot to play a D major scale, that would be harder. It would be D, E, reach up to the F sharp, little way to the G, A, B, C sharp, D. In truth, what organists do is whenever possible, we try and alternate the feet. That's a much easier, and in fact, in earlier times, organists did not use their heels, they only used their toes, and that was kind of essential. So one thing, I get, you see this written in organ music, but it's much more difficult. If you want a D major arpeggio, for instance, to play D, F sharp, A, you're gonna to have to cross your feet, and then high D, you're gonna to have to cross your foot under again. That's not easy to do. Could you go D, F sharp with one foot? That's a big leap. Some organists can reach it, some can't. And then A to D, there's no way you can broach one foot from A to D and get it legato. It's just, it's just not possible. So much more typical of organ writing is to do arpeggios alternating. So instead of D, F sharp, A, D, you go D, A, F sharp, D. And you see this all the time in the works of 
especially Baroque composers. So it's always high, low, high, low, high, low, high, low. And that's, that's really easy for organists to do. And if you want to impress somebody with your pedal technique, you play a solo like that, that alternates the two feet. And it sounds terrific and people are very impressed and it's not all that difficult to do. And I have to say as a composer, I love writing things that are easy to do and sound terrific. <laughs> I hate writing things that are really hard to do and just for a mediocre result. So if you remember, the general rule is alternating is better. Two leaps in the same direction are hard to do. Okay, so that's the pedal board, but you may have noticed that most organs also have a division of the organ that is shuttered. And there is, at the end of the pedal board, there are, there are three, well, could be any number of, of uh, <laughs> I'm blanking on the word, the, the pedals that, that open and close the shutters, okay? The swell shoes, they're called, that's it. On, depending on where the organ is built and what time period it's from, you may not have any swell division of the organ at all. There might be nothing enclosed. Um, both Dr. Labor and I have spent a considerable time in Amsterdam, and you could go to a dozen churches with very large organs there and never see one of them that has any of the organ enclosed in a shuttered swell box. Here in America, it's normal that there's usually at least one manual that is in a swell box, and quite often there's two. The organ that I play down at Plymouth has four divisions in shutters. So I have five, well, I have four swell shade shoes. So that means that's something else for the feet to do. The swell shades are most usually operated by the right foot. But when the right foot is on a swell shade, it obviously can't be playing the pedals. So if I wanted, let's say I wanted a pedal solo, ba -da 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 and I wanted a crescendo at the same time, I wanted to open the swell shades, can't be done can't be done because if I need my right foot for playing this, the pedals, I can't use it to do a crescendo to open a swell box at the same time. So you need to think about these things all the time. Another important thing about the organ is the fact that it can change its sounds very quickly by manipulating stops. You've heard the expression, pull out all the stops. That comes from the organ. That literally is a term from playing the organ that people on the street know and don't, who don't know anything about playing organ will talk about pulling out all the stops for something. And the stops are generally to the left and right of the, of the performer. Now, on some organs, again in Amsterdam, some organs, the stops extend so far to the left and so far to the right that you can't even reach them while you're sitting down, and it's typical to have an assistant, sometimes two assistants, one on either side, who actually do the stop changes for you. On American organs, it's much more usual to have them within reach of the organ. Now, I have to say that there's, depending on the nature of the organ, changing several stops at once can be an insurmountable task, or it can be very simple. If you were playing on an instrument that is built using mechanical action, sometimes they're called tracker organs, quite often there will be no assistance. When you pull a stop, you are actually pulling the lever that pulls a, a stick that turns turn and pull, actually you're doing the work of opening the windway to that set of pipes. If that's true, 
you can only do one or maybe two if they're adjacent at the same time. So sometimes an organist is limited and, and you have to remember they're usually done with the hands. So if you're playing, you can't do this while you're playing. You have to have a hand free to change a stop. So it can take, uh, you can't write, Da, 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 da. changing stops where I change volume. There's not enough time to get your hand up and down. However, on most, on a majority of organs today, we have combination pit, pistons, little buttons hidden just beneath each manual. And they can do things, a good combination action can do things in pretty much a split second. As soon as you touch the bottom electric controls, or more often today, uh, computerized controls change the stops to whatever combination you want. In which case, if you're writing for such an organ, you can have you can change as drastically and as much as you want. Um, computer memory is so cheap today that modern organs are pretty limitless. There's more possibilities than than I can imagine anyone having to use to do that. But you do need to be aware that some organs built in the older tradition won't have those electronic assists. So I just wanted to, um, I should point out that sometimes those uh, assists are done by toe studs. So rather than pushing a piston under the manual, it might be done by your foot doing something. That's yet one more thing for a foot to do. So, the organ can do all these things, but you can't do them all at the same time. And that's just kind of something, even if you're not an organ, organist, you can think, and then I play this, and then I have to reach there. Is there time to do that? Can I do that on my air organ in front of me? And that kind of can help you figure out um, what might be possible before you actually go to the instrument. So those are just some basic ideas I have about just the physical requirements of playing the organ. Thanks so much, Joe. Uh, Annie, was there anything that you wanted to show with the pedals? Yeah, sure. I've got my feet here on the screen, so I thought I'd just show what Joe mentioned. Um, here is a scale using one foot. <laughs> Here's the arpeggio figuration he mentioned. That last version is hard, but the high low is not because it's alternating feet. And here's the swell box. If you can see me open and close that. I can add to the feet. But in order to have dynamics, I need my right foot to be free. And then here are the buttons he was talking about to change stops, to change stops quickly. All right, I think that's good for the moment. Oh, I do have a mechanical action organ behind me. So we have a modern organ built by Holtkamp from 1950. That's the one I've just been playing. But in this space, we also have a continual organ and it is fully mechanical. Um, one of the interesting things on this instrument is that it's got divided stops and uh, when you have a mechanical action organ you can play around with um, drawing the stop on slowly and playing with the wind. <laughs> So you can be a little bit more sensitive with the wind when you've got a mechanical action organ. All right, let's, I think we can move to the next session. Great. Thank you for demonstrating that, Dr. Labor. Yeah, that was great.
well, the next question that we have is for George Baker. And George, um, I was wondering if you could speak a bit about the pipes and the registrations and what timbral acoustic considerations composers should be aware of when they're writing for the organ. Sure. Hopefully my audio is working. Yes? Great. The earliest pipe organs were composed of only flue pipes, which work like whistles. Flue pipes can be open pipes or they can be stopped pipes. Open pipes have even and odd harmonics, but stopped pipes have only odd harmonics. And that makes for different sounds, as you will hear. There are three families of flue pipes. Number one, the principles that are also called diapasons. Number two, the flutes and number three, the strings. They all work like whistles, but their construction details differ to make the various sounds. Diapasons and strings are generally open and many but not all flutes are stopped. A similar set of pipes from low to high notes is known as a rank, R-A-N-K. Later, a new class of pipe called the reed pipe came to be. It functions in a manner similar to the clarinet with one vibrating reed or metal tongue at one end and then the resonator on the other end. Over time, organ builders learned that by varying different parameters of pipe construction, the sounds could be very different. Well, today's organs still have flues and reeds. The principles, are the organ's quintessential organ sound. The flutes tend to be more mellow and the strings have a thinner and more incisive tone. So Dr. Laver, if you could please uh, demonstrate the three main families of the flute pipes. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay. Yep. Sorry, we just had to change the mics here. We were realizing that our setup wasn't uh, working exactly the way we wanted. Um, okay, so we're talking about principles, strings, and flutes. I'm gonna right. play them in that order, okay? So principle sound first. String sound next. And flutes. Is that okay? Great. Right. How about some of the reeds? Reeds. All right, we've got a very brassy trumpet on this organ. It's, it's a lot of the personality of this organ. So here it is. And then here are all the reeds on the swell. How about solo reeds, like, like an oboe or, or vox humana, clarinet? Okay, so that was the, tr the reed chorus. Um, you also heard the trumpet by itself. But here's an oboe, very buzzy oboe. And on this organ, we've got two other reeds. We've got a crumb horn, which has a French flavor. And a shell mai, which is kind of a boxier, older reed sound. And we also have a few reeds in the pedal. So most organs will have 
uh, at least one read that you could use as a solo, sometimes many possibilities. Great, super. Now, we have to choose sounds for the organ music and we choose registrations. In other words, we decide what stops to pull on. Our choices are based upon the stops on the organ, obviously, the characteristics of the music we are playing, and also the room acoustics. Uh, the art and science of organ registration is absolutely vast, and we could spend a lifetime talking about it. Organs exist, of course, in various sizes, shapes, colors, tuning temperaments, and we must adjust our registrations to fit all of these things. I want to bring up one main tenet of organ registration, and that is reinforcing the overtone series. As I said, the principal or diapason stop is the quintessential organ sound. And from those principal stops, we can make a chorus or a choir of diapasons by first choosing a stop playing the fundamental pitch, usually an eight foot stop. And from then we can reinforce the overtone series by adding principal stops that play the following pitches. Number one, a four foot stop, which plays the octave, two and two thirds, which plays the 12th. And then we go up the overtone series, uh, pulling on stops uh, of two foot, one and three fifths, one and one third, one and one seventh, one foot and even higher pitches. These numbers, by the way, refer to the speaking length of the longest pipe in the rank. So if you have an eight foot diapason, then the speaking length of that lowest pipe, usually a C, is gonna be eight feet. So when you hear those numbers, you know now what, what we're talking about. Uh, discussing the various national schools of repertoire and organ building and the sounds of these organs, it's way beyond the scope of, of this short uh, exposition today. But I would suggest that composers who don't have any experience with the organ, just grab one of your organist friends and say, hey, can I spend an hour with you? And, and you go up to the church or wherever it is, practice room, if you will, and uh, you know, check it out. See what the beast can do. And you know, feel it, play it. You see, it's not like a piano. And as, as we mentioned, also Joe mentioned uh, the swell box. Uh, so varying the intensity of sounds on an organ, you can do it basically in three ways. Number one, you can play more notes. You can stick your hands and play clusters on the keyboard. Some of the organs that you'll play will die when you do that, but you can try it anyway. Number two, you pull on more stops to make more sound. And number three, if they're swell boxes, then you open the boxes to the open position. And organ registration, you have to take all of these issues into consideration. One last thing is the acoustic. The acoustics of the building in which the organ is located, as many people have said, that's the most important stop of the organ. It's the room. It's like if you took a piano soundboard away or, or just had strings on a piece of wood, it's not gonna sound like a, uh, like a Stradivaria. The organ grew up in the Christian church, most of which were stone structures and there were no sound absorbing carpets, cushions, porous tiles on the ceiling. Organs sound best in this type of environment. However, as we know, many American churches have rather poor or even dead acoustics, and the organ will suffer. The organ sound will suffer. Sadly, we can't always play in Notre Dame Cathedral. We must make the best of what we have. So those are my few comments about pipes and acoustics. Thank you so much, George. That's great. Our next question is for Jonathan. Um, and Jonathan, we were wondering if you could give some advice for composers regarding notation. Um, when it comes to organ music, can you talk some about how much a composer should or should not notate to get the character of a piece to come across 
and perhaps how this notation might be interpreted across different organs. Sure. So I personally believe that less is more. Now this might come from my jazz background, but to me, when there is fewer notations on the page, that is that allows the interpreter to bring the piece to life. And when, this is especially true when it comes to the organ because no two organs are the same. So when we go to interpret a piece, we either have to come to the organ in the mindset of we're going to bring this piece to life, we're going to interpret it, or we're going to change everything that it says. Um, sometimes composers give too much information that is specific to one instrument. Just as an example, this happened to me a couple of days ago, I was recording a concert, a virtual concert for a Joe chapter, and I played a piece by Herbert Howells, and he gives all sorts of registration suggestions and manual couplings. Well, those don't work on the instrument that I was playing it on. So it's all this stuff that I have to think, oh, I got to change it or I got to change this. But so you're coming to it with a bit of a negative approach, like you're changing it. But I played on this same program, a piece by Matthias Weckmann, which is old music. And on a modern instrument, I was able to bring it to life by adding different interpretation and different stop changes that are not present based on what the music is suggesting. So in composition, I feel that if the composer gives dynamics, don't give the specific registrations, give the dynamics, but give a sort of affect with your dynamics, like um, sort of mysterious, like pianissimo mysterious, I know exactly what to do on any instrument to make that happen. Instead of writing all these different stops that, well, this organ doesn't do that, so I, 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 and so it's a bit of a, it's a bit of a challenge to try to adapt when it's extremely specific. And it might actually scare some people away from playing your piece if you're very specific. Whereas if you just give a general dynamics and affect, it might, people might be more encouraged to play it. Um, I can speak from my own experience in writing pieces and when people have played it, I am more interested in how people interpret the music than if they do it my perfect interpretation because I honestly don't have one. And what excites me is seeing how people bring it to life on different instruments and I don't give, I give just the dynamic uh, letters and the affect like mysterious and stuff like that are grand and they're able to sort of be inspired by that and by what the music itself is suggesting. So again, I feel that less actually is more because it, ins it inspires the performer to bring it to life instead of changing it. So if you look at some music where it says couple great to swell, great to like all of that, that's not very clear for us if we don't have those resources. So I would suggest instead of writing manuals, like writing the great or the swell or the positive, to write a, num a Roman numeral instead, just to say this is manual one. And of course we can change that. We can decide, oh, manual one is going to be manual three this time. So we can sort of change that without thinking, okay, the great and the swell. Um, because when you're using those sort of notations, you're suggesting a specific instrument. Because in the American classical organ, the great and the swell, oh, sorry, the great, yeah, the great, the swell and the choir all have a sort of connotation associated with them, but it's totally different from the récit, the swell and the grand orgue of a instrument in the French tradition. So just writing one, two, three is a little bit more clear for me. And one important point about the organ and composition and interpretation is that unlike any other instrument, the organ actually takes control. When, when I've been working in, when, during my doctorate at McGill, I worked at the Oratoire and the concerts were never about the performer or the compositions. It was always about the organ. It was, what's his name is playing the great Beccarat organ at the Oratoire. And so the instrument took over. And I think that if, unlike with the piano or the, yeah, like the piano or any other instruments, 
um, you can focus on the performer or the composition, but with the organ, I feel that it's totally different. And I think that as performers and as composers, we have to give up some of our control to the instrument and adapt to play it in, a, in what makes the instrument come to life. So you can play the same repertoire on 10 different organs, but each time you'll use different registrations and you'll use different ideas and interpretations on each instrument, but it's the same piece, but it's totally different and it's the same performer. So the only thing that's changing is the organ. So I feel that when you're writing your pieces for the organ, um, have like a clear sound in your mind, not a specific sound, and write that down and allow the interpreter to be inspired by your music and by your affect. So when, and when you're writing sort of notations, I think that being descriptive with words is sometimes better than using typical symbols because crescendo means completely different things in different time periods for our repertoire. We, we have the largest repertoire of any instrument going back to the medieval period up to the modern. So it's, it's a totally different approach and crescendoing can just mean opening the swell box or it could mean adding stops. So I would propose that instead of writing a crescendo, you can either write building with the same registration, which means you open the box or adding stops, which means that you're adding more instruments like you would in a orchestral crescendo. And um, viewing, viewing the organ as an instrument that is, um, viewing the organ as a big piano is definitely not the way to <laughs> view it. And I believe that thinking of it like the orchestra and when you're thinking of your dynamics, you like when you're writing orchestral music or choral music, you're not giving specific sounds, but you're adding different instruments using the standard dynamics. And I think that writing for the organ, you can think of it in that way. So in short, less is more and using descriptions over traditional um, notations for describing dynamics and tempo and uh, crescendos, I think is more successful. Great, thank you. Um, I'm gonna actually share my screen and share a couple scores that uh, Annie picked out to sort of demonstrate some different notational styles. Uh, just give me one second. All right. So Jonathan's absolutely right. Uh, and I just, I chose these two first pages from uh, two different scores, one by Messian, that's the one on the left, and one by Persichetti on the right. And you can see right off the bat that there's a, quite a different approach to notating registration and notating manuals. Um, now, we love Messian, and um, he was very particular with the sounds he was asking for. Uh, but the thing is, when you play Messian, you do often have to interpret it for the organ that you've got. So uh, Jonathan's right that there are changes and uh, adaptations that you have to make unless you have a very specific style of instrument. Um, and then the Persichetti, he took a very different approach. Uh, he did notate manuals, so we can see when uh, I think what's clear in Persichetti score is that you can see the foreground and background um, because he notates that uh, he notates a solo um, by indicating the swell is going to take one the one voice and the choir will take the uh, the accompaniment voices. So that's very helpful. Uh, and then he uses hairpins to indicate uh, use of swell box. So this is just uh, one one example. I've you know I've come across uh, the all sorts of ways of dealing with notation, but I think more often than not, composers are um, writing dynamic marks and character rather than giving specific stops these days. Great, thank you. Yeah, I think that one thing I would just 
add from the perspective of a composer who just wrote a piece for the organ for the first time is that there is uh, I, if you're open to letting go of some of the control it's a really lovely thing but I think we are used to you know being really detailed in the way we write our music these days um, but it is I, it is actually a real collaboration you know when you're working with an organist and you're writing an organ piece because as Jonathan said the instrument dictates certain things and then also the performer is going to be doing other things to to sort of make that happen and, and bring your piece to life and so I think having a bit of an open mind about sort of the timbral possibilities of your piece is is a useful attitude to have to go into all of this um, before we switch over to resources for further study I just wanted to ask if anybody else on the panel would like to add anything about any of these topics Um, I was really, I really like Jonathan's idea of expressing kind of the nature. And I would kind of take, as far as registration, I would take a, an approach halfway between uh, what Jonathan said and what George said about the different families. So I kind of think yeah, that there are some standard res registrations that organists are just kind of used to. And so if you kind of get like George had had Dr. Labor uh, play the principles. So I maybe you just specify that this is principle or this is a flute solo, that that's the basic timbre or I want a reed solo here um, without going into, you know, I want a flute triangulaire which is the, or, the organ I learned, uh, the organ I was familiar with had a flute triangulaire. And, um, you know, I've only played an organ with a flute triangulaire on it once in my life. So most of the time I would be very frustrated. But if somebody just said flute, then that gives me th what uh, Jonathan said, the chance to actually look at my organ and think, what, which of the flutes will best serve the purpose of of what I want at this time, but at least points me in the direction of: Did you want a flute sound, or, or did you want a did you want a reed sound here? Great. Anybody else have anything they want to share? We can yeah, move we on to some... move on anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Now so, yeah. Um, if if you have questions about any of the things that we just said, uh, throw them in the chat and we will uh, try to get to them at the end. This is being recorded right now and we will be posting it on our YouTube channel. So you can go back and watch uh, later if you, if you like. Um, all right, just to wrap up some of what we've been talking about, I wanted to share some of the resources if you want to dive into this a little bit deeper. Um, first of all, We've got, uh, I want to show you this book. This is by Sandra Sutherland. It's a, it's a skinny book, but it's called A Guide to the Organ for Composers and Others. And it really is a nice intro um, to the various things that we've been talking about. Uh, it's available from Wayne Leupold Editions. I put the um, link in the chat. Another great resource that Natalie and I came across was um, a series of, of videos that the American Guild of Organists has on their uh, education page. And these are called Lessons for the New Organist. They are put together, produced by Frederick Holman, uh, also an SU alum. And um, we're going to, I'm gonna put those in the chat too. So if you'd like to, you know, they're designed more for people, pianists who want to learn how to play the organ, but they're a really great resource for composers as well. Uh, that's what we found. Um, the other thing I want to share is a very nice handout that Joe Downing prepared for Natalie when she was getting ready to write her piece. And I'm going to put that in the chat as well. You're welcome to download it. 
It's got great information, much more detailed information than we were even able to go into today. So we invite you to, to have a look at that. Um, one of the, the happy byproducts of this process was that, as Natalie said, we were able to work together on a new organ piece. And we wrote up that process and our experience talking to composers. And uh, we're very grateful to the online journal Vox Humana for publishing it uh, just last week. So if you want to read about our process, I'm putting that in the chat as well. Or you can visit Vox Humana. Um, that's a great uh, online journal for all things related to the organ. The other thing we did was we embarked on what we call the composer interview project. We began interviewing um, a handful of composers about their experience writing for the organ over the summer. And uh, we put up a YouTube channel. You can look for it. It's called, uh, just search for Syracuse uh, composing for the organ. Um, but I'll also put the, oh, Brianna's got it in there for us. Awesome. Uh, it's in the chat now. So you can visit that and see some of the interviews we've already posted. We, ha we still have more to come. Uh, it takes a little while to add the captions and, and put them up there. Um, but this was, a, this was a wonderful project and we'd now like to show you a little homemade trailer video that <laughs> Natalie put together of us describing this project uh, and some great clips from some of the interviews. If you want the version with captions, you have to go to YouTube to, uh, to watch it there. Uh, so just click on the link that Brianna shared. Hello, my name is Ann Laver. And I'm Natalie Draper. We'd like to offer a little preview of our composer interview project a series of recorded interviews we began conducting in the summer of 2020 to highlight a range of approaches to composing for the organ. We became interested in how seasoned composers approach the instrument, largely because we were embarking on a collaborative composition project of our own. I agreed to write a new work for Annie that would premiere on a virtual concert of new organ music in September of 2020. We were curious about how our process compared to others' experiences. We reached out to a handful of composers in July and August and invited them to talk with us over Zoom about their experiences writing for the organ. We decided to keep our questions relatively consistent so we could see if any patterns arose. We asked them, what first led you to write for the organ? What do you find most challenging or most gratifying about writing for the organ? What compositional techniques do you think work well on the instrument? And finally, what advice do you have for composers who wish to write for the organ for the first time? There were a few recommendations that came up in every interview. Almost everyone said that it was very crucial to get yourself in front of the instrument and to experiment with all that the organ can do. But at the same time, we were also really surprised and delighted to hear such a wide variety in perspectives and approaches to the instrument. Here are a few highlights from our interviews. I've written a, a ton of organ music for Jamie because um, we met and it's like, the, you know, the organ, um, more so than most other instruments, it, it, you really are making it for somebody to make it for an instrument. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a kind of serious in intercessor, not to use too ecclesiastical a term, but you do need to, there is, a, there, in, unless you yourself are playing it as, as for instance, Messiaen would have done, like your, 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 um, you're kind of you're kind of at the mercy of an interpreter in a way that that's so much more um, present than, for instance, like the oboe. What's so special about Nico's scores is they have absolutely no indication for registration. So the collaboration. <laughs> there's some. Happens. There's some, right? <laughs> yeah, there's some. There's some sort of adjectives and you know some some uh, some descriptors, but um, in a way the collaboration kind of happens over the ether through um, through that process and bringing the music to life on the organ um, from a registrational uh, scheme
perspective is, I think, uh, apart from the, the joy of playing the notes, is the joy of uh, this kind of closeness that we have as two musicians. But I think the most thrilling aspect of the organ is just the sheer dynamic variation of these this loud that can just shake your whole body and then the incredible soft that you can have when you close all the, all the boxes. Just to say, when you're writing for an organ, you cannot think about your writing for the organ. Um, you just have to write your own music. You have to work with the, uh, the performer, of course, but in the end, um, you have to say your own words and tell your own story, right? And it's just a different tool. You know, it was cool because working with both of them, they sort of took the limitations of the instrument, but also the, maybe they thought of things that could be done with the instrument that a lot of other people had never imagined before. Of course, knowing some idiomatic approaches to the instrument um, is helpful, but it's also dangerous because <laughs> Um, this is uh, maybe uh, um, there are two instruments where this is really or three instruments where this is really dangerous. It's the guitar and the organ and maybe the harp because it's so complicated uh, that you have to practice very long, very long, and after a while you are so good that you always uh, tend to do what you know, and of course you don't want to do that when you compose new music. What's gratifying to me is not even so much about the instrument itself. Um, above and beyond anything, any other instrument or any other combination, but just the fact that there, there are a lot of opportunities for the use of organ repertoire. Um, the fact that nearly all organists work in church context means that there is a much more regular performing life that goes on and a much more variety. You know, you can't play the same piece week after week. That's very different than say a concert pianist preparing you know, for six months, their recitals, their like single program that they're going to take around and tour. And, you know, and it's not just church services, many, many places, especially more in Europe than here. But even some here, there are weekly, in some cases, some places, daily organ recital series, you know, particularly throughout Germany. It's just sort of amazing. One of the mistakes I made was that in the end, it was a, a, a spectacular piece. And then I had the left hand uh, with a strong chord. And while the right hand had to do <laughs> but you couldn't hear what what he or she uh, uh, was playing the challenge is that the organ is so interesting and so complex that you would not think what it can do so learning about what the organ can do is learning um, that there are many, many other paths for inspiration and in, uh, invention. But the other, the other like compositional technique stuff is to figure out how to ha make a hierarchy of your material that is obvious. And this is, this is something that, and I think, Jamie, you can probably speak to this, but it's like, I feel like it should be clear when you're looking at the music, what information is foreground, what information is background, as clues or breadcrumbs to the to the interpreter in terms of like you know because you can make something 60 times louder just by going like Ooh. but for example things like a solo and accompaniment kind of texture that can be very useful to specify but you don't have to specify what that is you could say quiet solo quiet accompaniment let the organist choose what that what that best sound is going to be on the instrument at hand rather than writing down the name of what you saw there so I think, I think all of that is sort of, it's sort of conveying, it's conveying your musical ideas in, in the most general terms so that then a skilled organist can find a way to make that particular piece sound the very best it can on the, the organ that, that he or she is playing. What I don't like at the, of the instrument is uh, like the bass, you know, I like the bass to be pr precise on time, but it's not possible. Your experience with this instrument, with this specific instrument, will always be a bit different. And there are organs like the Craig Ed Saunders organ in Rochester, it's a personality. Like you are sitting there and they say, okay, what do you want to tell me? And there are other organs you have to force, uh, like, I don't know, like a horse that doesn't want to go. You composer nerdy time. You have to treat the organ weirdly like a transposing instrument. So it's yeah. sort of like when you 
when you do those scores where you're writing bass clarinet in treble clef and it's like down a ninth, like you have to, you do, as Jamie said, that's actually a great piece of advice, is to think about it as like a four octave instrument, basically. Yeah. But it's like, it's like a small box filled with holes where light will shoot <clears> out and make it feel like it's a 12 octave. Because yeah, that's what's, yeah. so, what's so bonkers about it is that it actually goes lower than and higher than anything else. At the end of one of our interviews, composer Eric Nathan commented that it was so nice to talk about music for a change. That's how we felt too. The year 2020 has been tough. It's been especially hard for musicians because there have been so many new obstacles to overcome. And on top of that, there's been so much unrest and uncertainty in our country. We felt like this project was a lifeline through all of this. It gave us the opportunity to engage with colleagues, talk about music, and be creative again. We hope you enjoy watching these videos, and we hope you'll engage with us on Facebook and learn more about this project. Great. So I think that at this point, we'll uh, open it up to some questions um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Labor. All right. So we've already got one. This is a great one from Jonathan Newmark. Um, I'm posting it in the chat now and I'll read it for everyone. He writes, I'm much more familiar with harpsichord writing than with organ writing. I've always felt that organ technique was closer to harpsichord technique than to piano technique. Would the panel care to comment on the harpsichord organ relationship, similarities and differences? Uh, I think I'll send this over to Joe first and then uh, if, if others want to comment, uh, we can take it from there. If you've got other questions, just pop them in the chat and I will, um, I will pass them on. I think you're absolutely right that playing the organ is much closer to harpsichord technique. Um, again, because there is no damper pedal on there. Of course, the difference with the harpsichord is that if you hold the key down, the sound is going to die relatively soon, as opposed to the organ that's going to sustain forever. But I think a good harpsichord technique will be very helpful to playing the organ, yes. George, did you want to add anything? Um, not really, uh, except for the one thought that uh, our friend uh, Johann Sebastian Bach played pretty well, I think, the organ, and he played pretty well the harpsichord and clavichord, and you know he would have been a great pianist, and whatever you put in front of him with keys, he could play. Uh, and uh, in my experience, uh, uh, some organs are extremely difficult to play. I mean, let, let's just talk about uh, playing the tutti on at Sansel Peace. I mean, playing the, the manual one with, with all the divisions uh, coupled together. There's a lot of friction, a lot of force required for that. And that's very, very, very different from, from most harpsichords, which, you know, are very precise, very quite quite delicate uh, to play and it almost, uh, uh, there are some organs like that. You, you just look at it and it'll play the note, you know. I don't like that kind of organ touch. You, you, you don't want to approach it and then have the notes just boop, go down. You, you want to have a little resistance, but not too much. Uh, uh, so I, I think it, it depends. Uh, I play the harpsichord, I play the piano. We have a piano and an organ here in my house, and I play them both, and I love them. I love them all. I think it's not a bad thing to be able to, to adapt and to play them all, you know, but you can't bang away at a harpsichord like you would perhaps a Bersendorf or Imperial, you know, you, you, you might break it, you know, break it in half. That's great. So, um, I've got another question that I'm going to post to everyone. This is from Antonio Sanz. I think I've got it. Yeah. So 
he, he asks, is it possible to change stops while notes are being held? In the pieces I've seen, it seems changes only happen in rests. Is there a reason for this? I, I think I'll take this one just because I can show it. Uh, and then if anybody wants to add, they can. So one of the reasons, Antonio, why we change stops in rests um, or other, you know, minuscule br breaks in the phrase is because it's the cleanest way to change the sound. That's not to say you can't change the sound while you're holding a note. And I'm going to try to show it to you. Can you see that? Yeah. And ah. all right, I'll play down here. So here's, here's a note. I've got the flute on. I'm going to add the four foot flute. So on that manual, changing stops, it's, it's very obvious that it's happening. Sometimes you can get a smoother crescendo, and I can do that if I use the stops on the swell because there are more eight foot unison uh, stops. I'm gonna start with the flute. So it is possible to do it. Um, I think it's probably more common that those changes are made right between uh, uh, phrases. George, did you want to add to that? No, I think that's great. Uh, there are pieces uh, where you have a perhaps a sexy chord uh, on the flute celeste, and then you, you press a piston and go to the tutti, or vice versa. That can happen, and you can do it. And uh, let's hear that. Uh, yeah, do it. <laughs> I did that with uh, my feet. I pressed the button with my foot because it's already set up as allowed. There you go. Okay. Any other questions? Just about you know physical aspects of the organ, or any um, any questions about the interview project, or anything you've anything you've heard today? Uh, we've got one more minute, and we've got uh, we've got one more question here from Chindu. All right, the question is, would a vibrato or tremulant be a color or character that is usually seen in organ music generally? Well, there's a very special stop on the organ. It's called the celeste. And um, we've got two celestes on this organ. We've got a string celeste and a flute celeste. And it is, it is definitely a special effect. You don't want to have the celeste on with the rest of the organ. Um, so it's, it's a little bit different than a tremulant. That's something else. A celeste is actually, um, it's two ranks and they're tuned uh, off of one another. So usually the celeste is sharp to the, the normal rank. So for instance, we've got a gamba by itself. Sounds like this with the celeste. Hopefully that comes through in this in this microphone. Uh, we've also got a flute version, which is a, a very very special ethereal sound, and uh, we usually use those for for magical moments in organ music. Now organ organs some organs also have a tremulant, and that's just a, that's a lever you would pull that actually makes the wind unsteady in whatever stop you have on. Now this organ does not possess that, uh, but many, um, many mechanical action organs will have a tremulant and they're very nice to use when you've got like a solo reed or a solo flute, you can, you can uh, have kind of a vibrato quality. Can I, can I just add to that? Yeah. So um, the organ that I play on is a very uh, orchestral organ from the night from 1930s and every manual has tremulants available every single manual has celestes on it and in the style of playing gospel music that's a very typical sound to use the tremulants all the way through 
it's also um, atypical of most organ music. The Alexander Schreiner, who was the famous organist at the Mormon Tabernacle in the mid 20th century, used to say that there are two uses for the tremulant, and they are both during rehearsal. So he didn't like to use tremulants at all. But again, it's just a matter of taste. So I've got one last question that I do want to just um, put up here for everybody to see. And the question is um, from Jeff Young, is access to an electronic organ helpful in writing for the pipe organ? Joe, go ahead. So I would say it's useful in the same sense that access to an electronic piano is useful in writing for the piano. You can figure out some things but to think that it really behaves like, you know, no matter if you push the Steinway or Bosendorfer on your Casio keyboard, it's really not a Steinway or a Bosendorfer. The same thing with an electronic organ. It's, it's really not the same thing. I would just add that um, it, I found it helpful when working on my piece when I didn't have access to the organ that I was, I was sort of working on to have the organ stop on my electric keyboard just only for the reason that Joe described early on about like the sustain and thinking about how to transfer your hand with legato. I think it's helpful for that. Um, but yeah, otherwise there's, you have to imagine a lot more <laughs> than what it can do. All right, I think we should probably leave it there. Um, if you have other questions, you could throw them in the chat. I'm keeping the Zoom room open but I've got to move to a different space now and we want to allow at least a little bit of time for you all to have a stretch break, um, do what you need to do. And we're going to come back uh, at 1.30 sharp for a presentation by George Baker. So please join us for that. And um, did I leave anything out, Natalie? No, we're good. Thanks so much, this has been great. And uh, we'll see you at 1.30.